class already? Transcendentals, I can't wait to learn about e calculus. You make me go into logarithms, aren't easy for me. When limits got you down and your mind won't work at all, don't worry about it, baby. Here comes Lopetaha. Calculus, early transcendentals, hyperbolic ghost, the cat and Mary. Calculus. Learn real-world models when you make it to calculus <laughs> Greetings, calculus students. The topic for today, continuous functions. Continuous functions are a special type of function. In fact, they're the kind of function that really works best in calculus class. The object of the lesson today is to learn how to recognize continuous functions and also to catalog the most commonly used types. This work will build upon our knowledge of limits and it'll put us in the position to use some of the best theorems in calculus, including the extreme value theorem and even the fundamental theorem of calculus. Hello again. For today's topic, we've got continuity. Continuity is a property that functions can have. It's a property that if the function doesn't have it, Nothing that we're going to do in this class is really going to work. So all of the calculus stuff that we want to do, things like derivatives and integrals and all that good stuff, requires that you're dealing with a function that's continuous. So we're going to start off by you know introducing the concept of continuity in an informal way and then work our way up to having a real precise notion of what it means and then we will want to figure out what kinds of functions are continuous. And I don't want to give away the surprise too much, but the answer is just about all the functions that you really have ever worked with or, or care about are continuous, except for maybe a few places that we know about, that we can work around. So let's get started with the informal notion of what continuity is. So informally, Continuous functions are functions that don't have any jumps or breaks or holes in their graphs. And you can think up sort of natural scenarios where a function may or may not have these sort of jumps or holes in their graphs. Let's start with an example on the left here of a position function of an object that's moving around in a straight line. So I've got this object moving in a straight line. The object is represented by that red dot there on that line. And, you know, the, the object may move forward along this line for a, while, for a while, and then it may turn around and come back, go downward for a ways, and then come back up and, you know, maybe stop right there. If we're talking about a material object, a material object can't be moving along this line suddenly disappear and then reappear at a completely different point on the line, right? Until we get some sort of Star Trek level thing where you can beam from a ship down to a planet or something like that and you disappear in one spot and reappear in another. Until that time comes, we can say it's a physical impossibility that you know an object's going to just disappear and then reappear somewhere else. So for that reason, when I graph the motion of this object, you know, the way I've drawn it there, it's going up for a ways, and then it starts coming back down. It comes down here like this, and then comes back up. Maybe it stops right there, I don't know. So it's got a starting place and an ending place. And when I look at the, the graph of its motion here, this s equals s of t graph, yeah, it doesn't have any jumps or breaks. It doesn't have any holes because that just corresponds to the physical reality that the object couldn't disappear suddenly and then maybe reappear somewhere else. On the other hand, though, 
if we were thinking about a graph of the amount of money in my bank account over time, you know, that kind of graph could have some jumps and skips and things like that in it. So maybe my time on my time axis here, maybe T is in months or something like that. And maybe I get paid once a month. So there's one month, two months, three months, and so on. Maybe my bank account, you know, does something like I've got this much money for the first month and then I get paid and then it goes up. And then maybe there were some expenditures and it comes down. And maybe I got laid off work for a month or two and then, you know, my money just kept going down like this. When you look at the graph of my money in the bank, it's, it suddenly jumps from one value to another. And you get this sort of thing going on, right? This is the idea of a function being discontinuous at certain places. So the left graph, s equals s of t, is continuous. A of T here was discontinuous. But anyway, you know, when you think about it graphically, discontinuities are just places where the, you know, the graph has a jump or a break or maybe a hole or something like that. With respect to continuity, we often refer to the um, function's domain. So, or maybe a part of its domain that we care about. So we might say something along the lines that F, this function F is continuous on the interval zero to five or something along those lines. Because maybe, you know, outside of 0 to 5, the function's not even defined. Before we can really make sense of continu continuity on, on large domains, like an interval from 0 to 5, or maybe the whole real number line or whatever, we first have to talk about what do we mean by continuity at a particular point. Like, for example, up here on the graph at the right, intuitively, I think whenever I'm looking at x equals 2, there's a jump in the graph at that point. I would say that this function is not continuous at two. But on the other hand, if I would look at like 3.5 or something like that, I don't see any breaks or jumps in the graph there. So I would say the function is continuous at that point. So it's easier for us to, d to define precisely what we mean by a function being continuous at a particular point. And then once we can talk about a function being continuous at a particular point, we can expand it to talk about the function being continuous on a large domain. So with that in mind, let's talk about continuity at a point. And we'll stay informal about it for a little bit longer. So informally, we think about a function being continuous at a point, let's say x equals a, if the graph of f does not have a hole or a break at that point, x equals a. It would pass the pencil test. The idea is that if it's continuous at x equals a, you can draw the graph of the function near x equals a without lifting your pencil. So let me give you an exa a few examples of how it could not be continuous. In the left graph there, I might have a function that's coming along, and it's doing something like this, and then it gets to a, and then there's just like a little hole, and then it goes on about its business like that. So here, f of a is not defined. Or you could have something like this going on, like maybe your function just like blows up there and get some infinite limit, which we've seen in previous lessons. This sort of thing happens, right? Usually happens at a place where you're divided by zero. So it's another example where the function is undefined, but it's even worse. It has an asymptote there. Or you could have something like where the function's coming along. It could be defined at A, but there's like something, some sort of jump or skip there. Like something like this could be going on. Like it comes along and it's it's defined at A, but then it suddenly jumps up here and then does something like this. Like that sort of thing can definitely happen. Just like in our function that we were looking at a minute ago that was keeping track of how much money I have in the bank. So all of these are sorts of things that can happen in a very natural way. And so if you think about what's going on with these examples, you can think about it in terms of limits. In the first example on the left, you know, that function, even though f of a is undefined, it has a limit at a. On that leftmost example, I don't know what that number is there, but there's some number there that the, the function values are getting close to. So the limit exists, but the problem is, is that the function itself is just undefined there. So it's got a little hole. In the second example, the limit at a does not exist. It equals infinity. Infinity is just a way of describing the way that a limit doesn't exist. And then the example on the right, the limit doesn't exist because you know the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are not matching up. That's where we're going with this. We're going to 
the way we're going to define continuity is in terms of limits. And so in this box here, we have the precise definition of what we want for continuity at a point. So f being continuous at a point, a, simply means that when you take the limit as x approaches a of f of x, you had better get f of a. And you'll see when you look at these examples that I drew up here that none of them satisfy that condition. The, the one on the left, f of a doesn't exist. So even though the limit as x approaches a of f of x exists, it can't equal f of a because f of a is not a thing that is defined. And then on the, the second one and the third one, the limit just doesn't exist. So it can't equal f of a even if f of a is defined. Like on the, the one on the right, f of a is defined, but the limit doesn't exist. By the way, so what this is really saying is that continuity at a point a means exactly that f has that direct substitution property at a. Now you may remember, as you were calculating limits, it sure is nice when a function has the direct substitution property. Am I right? Because all you gotta do is plug in the number to get the answer for the limit. So think about this. If we had some sort of general theory for telling us when functions are continuous or not, that would tell us that, you know, it would tell us when calculating limits are going to be easy. So knowing something about continuity of functions translates in a practical way into making limits easy to compute because it just means you can do direct substitution. So there's one reason why you should care about continuity. I'll give you some others as we go. In this definition, it, it's a very short, short and sweet definition, but you may want to unpack it a little bit. If you unpack it a little bit, you can turn it into a checklist for checking continuity, verifying whether a function is continuous or not at a point. In order for that equation in the definition of continuity to be true, you need the right side of that equation to actually be defined. So you need f of a to be defined, and you need the left-hand side of that equation to exist, so you need the limit as x approaches a of f of x to exist, and then, of course, once you know that both the left-hand side and the right-hand side independently exist, you need to check that they're equal. So you can turn checking continuity into a sort of three-step process. And if any one of the three steps fails, then your function is not continuous at A, or in other words, discontinuous at A. So let's see an ex a practical example of how we do this. So let's start off where I've just given you a function, some mystery function, and all you have is its graph. But from the graph, you can tell what limits are, right? And we'll get into the algebraic stuff here in a second. I want to use the graph of f there, the blue graph, to identify the points where f is not continuous, i.e., where is f discontinuous? Well, I think at a glance, you can see that there are about be five different places where we should be concerned about the continuity of f. The first one is at 0. The second one is at 3 because you can see from the graph there's a jump there, right? At six, there's a jump, and at eight, there's a hole. And also, the endpoints are problematic too. We'll talk about why the endpoints are a problem. Well, briefly, the endpoints are a problem because notice in the definition in the continuity checklist, you need, in part two, you need this two-sided limit to exist, but when you're at an endpoint, you don't have a two-sided limit. You only have one-sided limits. In order for the two-sided limit to exist, you need both of the one-sided limits to exist. So you have problems at endpoints when you're checking continuity. So let's just go down the line at the, with these five points and see what doesn't work out in that checklist. x equals zero. We can rule out zero because f is, an even not, f is not defined as zero. f of zero is undefined because there's a, a little open circle there at that point. At zero, it fails the first condition there. F of zero is undefined. Automatically, it's discontinuous at that point. How about at x equals three? Well, at x equals three, let's, let's go down the checklist here. Is f of a defined? Is f of three defined? Well, yeah, f of three is defined. In particular here, we see f of three is equal to three. That's the y value at that point. But two, I see that the limit as x approaches 3 of this function does not exist. And it doesn't exist because the limit as x approaches 3 from the left does not equal the limit as x approaches 3 on the right. In particular, the left-hand limit is 6, and the right-hand limit is equal to 3. So 6 doesn't equal 3 last time I checked. 
I think it would be a good exercise for you to go ahead and fill in the reasons for these other ones. So see if you can figure out what's going on at x equals 6, x equals 8, and x equals 10. So now let's do a bit more of a practical example. Most of the time we don't have some crazy graph just handed to us. Most of the time we have some sort of formula for our function. And on the basis of the formula, we'd like to do analytic techniques to see if it's continuous. So here I have this function, 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, all divided by x squared plus 5. And I want to know if it's continuous at 5 and at negative 5. And I want to use that continuity check sheet to see. So let's check out what's happening at x equals 5 first. The continuity check sheet says, first you need to check, is the function defined at that point? So 1 f of 5, well, we're dealing with a rational function here, and the only way it's going to be undefined is if you divide by 0. But it looks like plugging 5 into the denominator doesn't yield 0. It gives me 50 in the denominator, so I get something like, I don't know, 66 over 50. Of course, you could reduce that to 33 over 25, I suppose. The point is, that's a number, right? 33 over 25 is defined. So f of 5 is defined. So it passed step number 1 in this checklist. 2. Can we calculate the limit as x goes to 5 of this function? Well, we certainly can. We learned in the previous lesson that if you want to take the limit of a rational function, as long as you don't get 0 in the denominator, you can just plug, plug your number in and whatever you get for the answer is the limit. So this is just going to be 2 times 5 squared plus 3 times 5 plus 1 all over 5 squared plus 5 times 5. And we already saw that that works out to 33 25ths. So that tells me that the limit as x goes to 5 of f of x exists because I calculated it and it equals a number. And then lastly, we do see when we compare our notes on steps 1 and 2, the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x turned out to be 33 over 25, which is exactly f of 5. Therefore, yes, f is continuous at x equals 5. And then the part b of this problem asked us to say, what's going on at negative 5? Well, let's see if we can figure out that. Well, at negative 5, let's just go down the check sheet. First thing we got to do is like, what is f of negative 5? Well, when I look at the original function, if I try to plug negative 5 in there, I get 25 minus 25 in the denominator, and that's a problem. I can't divide by 0, so f of negative 5 is undefined. So we're getting division by 0. So as soon as you, if you, if you fail any one of the three steps, the function's not continuous. So this one failed the first step. It's just not defined at that point. So f is not continuous. Well, let's, instead of saying not continuous, let's say discontinuous. You know, what this check sheet sort of approach is telling you is that, hey, you can check continuity pretty easily as long as you can compute limits and as long as you can plug the number in and you get the same result. And we spent a lot of time, we developed a lot of techniques for computing limits. So at this point, we should feel pretty good about this. If someone asked me about continuity at a point, no problem because I can compute limits. We have some rules for continuity. I want you to keep this in your mind as we're going through this lesson today. And today's lesson is another one that is kind of long. It's a little bit heavy. There's a lot going on here. Um, but one of our big goals is to figure out all the different kinds of functions that are continuous and where are they continuous and like for what values are they continuous. We're going to take that same approach that we've been using all along that I keep, I keep using this analogy of atoms and molecules. So we want to figure out those sort of atomic level functions that are continuous. Once I know what all the atoms are and how they behave, then that will inform me about how I can, you know, think about continuity for more comp complicated functions, like the big molecules. One way that you build molecules in function land is you add functions together, you subtract functions, you multiply them, that sort of thing. You divide, you raise it to powers. So this rule, theorem 2.0, or these rules for continuity theorem 2.9 are just telling us, hey, if the little pieces that you're trying to use to assemble your function are continuous at a point, then if you build them with addition and subtraction and multiplication and that sort of thing, then the result is going to be continuous. Anyway, going down the line on these, it tells you that when you sum two continuous functions at a point, you get a continuous function at that point. If you subtract, then the function, the difference of the functions will be continuous. So it's all assuming that 
f and g are individually continuous at the point a so the product if you take a continuous function multiply it times a constant if you divide of course when you're dividing you just got to watch out that you're not dividing by zero so in rule e there we rule out you know if g of a is going to be we got to make sure g of a is not equal to zero and then f is you know for doing powers and a little bit later we'll get into roots like how to deal with square roots and cube roots and that sort of thing each of these things is not very difficult to prove given the definition of limit i'm not going to belabor going through and proving everything as we go along in this section if we did it'd take forever but i do want to give you just a little sense of how you'd go about it because i do think it is important that you see these rules that we come across as not coming from some sort of tone, stone tablet you know handed down from god or something like that i mean these are things that we can figure out okay so you don't have to view all these theorems as like magical or something. So let's do the part B. Like how would we go about proving that? And what, what needs to be proven? It's like if I was going to prove, take one step back and think about what the hypotheses of this theorem are. The hypotheses are that both F and G are continuous at A. And then we want to argue that the difference of F and G would be continuous at A. So here's how that proof would go. It'd go something like this. Since um, F and G are continuous, at x equals a, then according to the definition of continuity, that tells us that f and g have that direct substitution property for limits, right? So we got limit as x goes to a of f of x. We know what the answer is. It's f of a, the direct substitution. And same thing for g. If we take the limit as x goes to a of g of x, going to get back g of a. So now we can use that information to look at the difference. If we look at the difference function, so we're going to do the limit as x approaches a of the difference function. It'll look like f minus g of x. Well, that, that notation just means f of x minus g of x. But we had a limit law that says when you're taking the limit of the difference between two functions and you know that the individual limits exist, that you could break it up as a difference of the limits. So I can use limit law, whatever it was, theorem 2 point. And remember, I'll have to look back what the number of the theorem was, but I can break this up as limit of f of x minus limit of g of x. But hey, we just said that the limit of f of x individually is f of a, and the limit of g of x is g of a. So I can apply that here, right? So that works out to f of a minus g of a because of what we assumed. And I can write that as f minus g of a like that. So when you look at this total, the totality of this equation that I just wrote down, when I take the limit of the difference function, the answer that I got was just direct substitution. And so that shows that the difference function is continuous. And we're done with the proof. And all the other ones would go in a very similar way. You would just use the, the appropriate limit law, like at this one step right about here, I use limit law to the one for difference, uh, difference of limits. So you would just use, you know, could modify this argument for the other parts there too. But anyway, I, I, it's not the sort of thing that I'm going to put on a test. I just want you to understand that, you know, most of these big theorems that we write down have some explanation. And sometimes it's helpful to think about why. Okay, so now, maybe more importantly though, why is theorem 2.9 useful? Well, I alluded to this earlier. We're going to establish that we have all these basic functions that are continuous at each point in their domains. So we're talking about functions like your, you know, powers of x or polynomials, rational functions, um, trig functions, all these basic functions, things like e to the x, natural log of x, functions involving radicals. And that pretty much covers every kind of function you might ever see in your life, right? So we'll establish that these basic versions of these kinds of functions have continuity. And then we can take that theorem 2.9 and stitch them together to form more complicated functions. You know, things like this example I have at the very bottom of the screen here. Like a function like that is where I've stitched together like a power function, a natural log, an exponential, a trig function, a root function. So a function like that is going to end up being continuous wherever it has a definition, like wherever it's defined, it turns out. So 
that'll be good. In the spirit of building up a long list of basic functions that are continuous, we're going to start with polynomial and rational functions because they're sort of the simplest kinds of functions. Part A of this theorem says polynomials are continuous. And they're continuous for any x, in the, like all real numbers x. So polynomials don't have any bad places where they have a jump or a skip in their graph. Polynomials are always completely good on the whole real number line. Rational functions are also continuous except for those places where their denominators come out to zero. So, you know, a rational function usually doesn't have too many places that make the denominator equal to zero. So you just have to watch out for those few bad places, and then you know your rational functions are completely good. So this theorem, 2.10, is a direct result of a theorem that we talked about in a previous lesson, theorem 2.4. So we showed that both polynomials and rational functions have the direct substitution property. That when you want to take the limit of a polynomial or a rational function at x equals a, all you gotta do is plug in a, provided that that doesn't cause you to divide by zero. That's exactly what continuity is. Continuity is the direct substitution property, like, like right here. That says a polynomial is continuous. That's the definition of continuity. It has the direct substitution property. Same thing here. The definition of continuity is the direct substitution property. So we already knew that polynomials and rational functions were continuous. We just didn't call it continuity back then when we were using that fact. When we were using theorem 2.4 before, we were just using it to calculate limits. So for example, look at this function that I've got at the bottom of the screen here. You can see that that's the kind of function we're dealing with here is a rational function. And so I know by theorem 2.4, it's going to be continuous at all the points on the real number line, except for the few places where it might be equal to zero in the denominator. By theorem 2.4, this function f is continuous at all real numbers x, except those x's for which the denominator x squared minus 1 is equal to 0. And we know what those x's are, i.e. x equals plus or minus 1. So um, if I would draw a picture of all the x's where this function is continuous, it would look like this. Like all these x's, oops, except for that one right there, and that one right there. So, great. Polynomials and rational functions are really easy to deal with when you're thinking about continuity. Because we already knew they had the direct substitution property for limits. And that's what continuity is. Soon we'll get to more complicated functions involving radicals or trig functions or things like that. But another way that we can build complicated functions from simpler ones is to compose functions. And so I want to give you a little reminder of function composition. Function composition is whenever you plug one function inside of another. So I have an example here where I've got g of x is equal to x squared plus 1, and f of x is the square root of x. What would be the composition f composed with g of x? I bet you've seen that notation before in previous classes. You probably called it fog, or maybe you felt like it caused your brain to go into a fog. All it means is to do this, f of g of x like that, which that means f of, well, g of x was x squared plus 1. And then this notation means take x squared plus 1 and that whole expression and put it in place of x in the formula for f. So that would end up giving you the square root of the quantity x squared plus 1. This function that is the composition is, you know, more complicated than its pieces. So I built up a more complicated function by sticking one inside of another. And so the natural question to ask here, if we know about the continuity of f and g individually, what does it tell us about the continuity of the composition, f composed with g? And that's the content of theorem 2.11 the proof of which is a little bit beyond the scope of this course, I think, but we can certainly use it to good effect. Let me uh, discuss the theorem 2.11 a little bit. All it says is that it's a little scary looking when it's a, or it's a little hard to parse out, but you've got an inside function and an outside function. 
<clears throat> when you're looking at f compose with g, g is the inside function, right? Like we have here. g is the one that's on the inside. When you plug in an x, it goes into g first, and then whatever you get as an output, that goes into f. Is how composition works. So in this theorem 2.11, We've got an input A that we're interested in, you know, wanting to know if the function is continuous at that point. So if the inside function is continuous at that point, and then you take that point and you plug it into G, then you need the outside function F to be continuous at that G of A. Then if those two things happen, you know that the composition is continuous at that point A. So let's see how that would work with this particular example here at the bottom H of X. I want to understand how to apply that theorem to this specific example. I need to identify what's the inside function and what's the outside function. And I think it's pretty clear what your two functions are that you would need to compose to get h of x. So I would take my f of x, the outside function, to be just raising things to the fifth power. And I would take my inside function to be that rational function on the inside there, x squared minus 4x plus 3 divided by x squared minus 1. And now I can analyze those two pieces separately. And that really is sort of the philosophy we've been going under all along here. Get our hands on the little pieces, understand them to understand the bigger ugly piece. What do we know about g of x there? g of x is a rational function, and f of x there is a polynomial. And we know polynomials and rational functions. We had a theorem that said Rational functions and polynomials are continuous. Um, and with rational functions, you only have to worry about um, where you get zero in the denominator, right? Well, with g, it's rational, so it's continuous except at x equals plus and minus 1 because those are the values that make the g function equal to zero in the denominator. f being a polynomial, we know it's continuous at all x. That's what that previous theorem said. That tells us with respect to the outside function, we don't really have anything to worry about. You know, if f is going to be continuous at g of a, that's always going to be true. So it's really the first condition there that g needs to be continuous at a. By this theorem 2.1 or 2.11, h of x, which is actually f composed with g, right, of x, is continuous at all x except x equals plus and minus 1 because those were the only places where the inside function g was discontinuous, and then the outside function f, it didn't have any issues at all, where it could be causing a discontinuity. So sometimes it can happen that, you know, the reverse of this sort of thing happens, that like the inside function is A-OK, -okay. you can plug in any numbers you want into the inside function, but then the outside function will have some issues. It doesn't always happen that the bad places happen on the inside function, they can happen with the outside function too. But that's the, the, the spirit of this, what I really want you to be focused on is that we had this big function and we disassembled it into some component pieces and we analyzed the component pieces separately for continuity and then that told us the continuity of the composite function. The content of theorem 2.12 is that when you're taking the limit of a composition, you can go ahead as long as the, the functions are appropriately continuous, you can pull the limit inside the outside function. So when you look at the equations here that, you're use, that are the result, it's just saying as long as the functions are appropriately continuous, you can pull the limit inside there and then take the limit of the inside function because that may be simpler. The, fir the only difference between the first thing and the, the, the first part of theorem 2.12 and the second part, the first one says that the that g is continuous at a the second one doesn't say exactly that g is continuous it just says that g has a limit now we know that having a limit is not enough to guarantee continuity for a function so here it may be possible that the inside function is not continuous but it has a limit as long as it has a limit though as long as the outside function is continuous we still need the outside function to be continuous but we can get by with the inside function being discontinuous as long as it has a limit, is what part two is saying. So part two makes it a little bit more um, versatile, but most of the time you don't even need that. To give you an example of how you would apply this theorem, I've got this limit here that I want to evaluate, limit of 2x squared minus 5, all that raised to the third power. 
Well, according to this theorem, let me try to break it down. So if we let h of x be the, the function that we're trying to take the limit of here, so 2x squared minus 5 cubed, let f of x equal the outside function is used to compose h, and let g of x be that inside function. So g of x is going to be 2x squared minus 5. So we have our h of x is really f of g of x, right? The composition. Now what do we know about those functions f and g? They're both polynomials. So f and g are continuous at all real numbers. So when you think about the conditions that have to be satisfied for theorem 2.12, either part 1 or part 2, because our inside function is continuous everywhere and our outside function is continuous everywhere, part 1 or part 2 would apply. And so it tells us we can pull the limit inside. So theorem 2.12 applies to computing this limit. x goes to 2 of 2x squared minus 5 to the third. And we'll just go ahead and do the calculation here real quick. So we can do this. Limit as x goes to 2 of 2x squared minus 5 to the third. Well, we can bring the limit inside that third power. Now inside there, the limit that's inside the third power, we're taking the limit of a polynomial. And we know polynomials have the direct substitution property. So we'll go ahead and direct substitute and get 2 times 4, 8 minus 5 would be 3 cubed equals 27. Because we noticed that the function that we wanted to take the limit of was a composition of functions that were nice and continuous themselves, it made evaluating the limit very easy. It just boiled down to doing direct substitution again. Yeah, continuity. If you know something about continuity, it's great. It makes t taking limits easy. So that applied. So we were using theorem 2.12 part 1 there because we were using the fact that the inside function was continuous at the point, which was 2 in that example. And f was certainly continuous at g of a, which was turned out to be 3. That was what we got when we plugged 2 into the inside function. Both of those facts were true because f and g were both continuous for all x in the world. So certainly at 2 and 3. And so we had the conditions in place so that we could use the formula which says you can pull the limit inside the outside function. Now in the next example I've got it set up so that the inside function is not continuous at the point that we're trying to evaluate the limit at. So in this next example x is going to 2. Now notice the denominator there when you try to plug in 2 you get 0, right? So the inside function there is not continuous. But I don't need it to be continuous necessarily. That's what part 2 says. Part 2 says that the inside function doesn't have to be continuous. It just has to have a limit. Let's let f of x be the cubing function and g of x be that rational function. So g is our inside function, right? We can take the limit as x goes to 2 of this inside function g of x now this function is a rational function, and it's getting a zero in the denominator. But we've seen that sometimes we can still calculate the limit, even though the, you're getting a zero in the denominator, if you can do some factoring and canceling. And something good happens. So let's see here. If we factor the numerator, I can factor that as x minus 2 times x minus 3, I believe. Yeah. And then I can factor the denominator as x minus 2 times x plus 2. Hallelujah. Something good cancels. What a coincidence. To calculate that limit, I no longer have the thing that was causing 0 to be in the denominator. And I see that I can do a direct substitution now into the pieces that remain. And I get 2 minus 3 in the numerator, so minus 1 in the numerator. And 2 plus 2, 4 in the denominator. So that function, that inside function was not continuous at x equals 2. The reason it wasn't continuous at x equals 2 is because it's not defined at x equals 2. And we know that the function, that's the first step in our three-step checklist. The function has to be defined at the point in question. So g of x is not continuous at x equals 2. But when I look at the limit as x goes to 2, the limit does exist. It comes out to a negative 1 fourth.
So the second part of that theorem kicks in. And by the way, the function f is certainly continuous, right? It's a polynomial, so it's continuous everywhere. So let me just make a quick little note here that our f function is continuous for all x. We always need the outside function to be continuous at the point that matters. And in this case, our function f is continuous everywhere. So since that inside limit existed and the outside function was continuous, so theorem 2.12 part 2 applies, and we get the limit as x goes to 2 of the composition. We can pull the limit in there. And we already calculated the limit on the inside. It came out to negative 1 fourth, right? So we get negative 1 fourth to the third. And negative 1 fourth to the third is negative 1 over 64, I guess. So there you go. So again, the, the philosophy of it was that we have a limit that we want to take. If we can break the function down that we're taking the limit of into its component pieces, and we understand the component pieces separately, we can use that information to our advantage in calculating limits. And in particular, we can use this very nice rule that tells us when we can pull a limit in from the outside to the inside of a composition, which is a pretty nice thing to be able to do. We have one more little diversion we need to talk about before we get on to sort of building up our repertoire of functions that are continuous. We still got to get to the trig functions and the things involving radicals and all that kind of stuff. But we got to talk about what we mean by continuity on an interval. Intervals turn out to be very important in calculus. I'll show you in a second. But first of all, what do I mean by an interval? So intervals are just, you know, little subsets of the number line. And they take the following forms. So I'm sure you've seen intervals before, but I just want to give make sure that we we're all on the same page about them. You know, working from the upper left and going down, we've got four different ways that you can have finite intervals from A to B. Remember that when you have a parenthesis, that means that the endpoint is not included. And if you have the square bracket, that means the endpoint is included. So you can have these finite intervals or you can have these intervals that go on forever in one direction. You can start at A and then move to the right forever, and then you would get the interval A to infinity. And then you can do the same thing with round, you know, parentheses and square brackets to indicate whether the endpoint is included. Um, I suppose the whole real number line is technically an interval too. It just goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. But usually you just call that R. We're interested in defining what we mean by, what do we mean when a function is continuous on an interval. Because the definition of continuity relies on the notion of a two-sided limit, then we have a little issue because we have, um, when you have an endpoint, you can't really define a two-sided limit there. You've only got one side. So we have to sort of make an exception for what goes on at the endpoints and come up with a different kind of continuity called right continuity or left continuity. So we'll get to that in a second. But I just want to point out, I went through and did a little survey up through like the beginning of chapter five of how many times is it important that we know that a function is continuous on an interval. So this is a super fundamental thing in calculus. Functions having the property of being continuous on an interval is super important. Look at all these theorems I found. Every last one of these theorems requires that in order for it to be true, the function has to be continuous on some kind of interval. The first one, the extreme value theorem. Contin the function is continuous on the closed interval A to B. The mean value theorem, which in some ways is the most fundamental theorem of all of calculus, you need the function F to be continuous on the closed interval A to B. 4.7. Um, when you want to know when a function is increasing and decreasing. Let's suppose f is continuous on the interval i, where this time i could be any one of those kind of intervals we were talking about at the top. Oh, the first derivative test, you're going to use that a lot. Assume f is continuous on an interval. Finding extreme extrema of um, functions, like when you got maximums and minimums, super important topic. Theorem 4.9 here, you got to have a function that's continuous on an interval. Second derivative test this is another way to calculate minimums and maximums. We need something called the second derivative to be continuous on an open interval. And last but certainly not least, the fundamental theorem of calculus requires that your function be 
continuous on AB. And you know that if you're taking a class called calculus and there's a theorem called the fundamental theorem of calculus that you probably want to like pay attention on that day. Luckily for you, you won't run into the fundamental theorem of calculus until the sec second calculus class. Obviously, the point of me telling you all this is that function being a continuous on an interval is super important in calculus. All of these big name brand theorems that we need that are like the most useful things in calculus require that you understand what it means for a function to be continuous on an interval. So, with that in mind, let's get at what do we mean by a function being continuous on an interval. So, like I said, we have to talk about what's going on at the endpoints. That's what we got to make an exception for. So, we have the notion of a function being continuous from the right at the point A. So that means, so when you're doing continuous from the right, that means that you're probably looking at the left-hand endpoint of an interval, but then that means that if you're looking at the left-hand endpoint of an interval, that the points to the right of it are defined, right? So I've got some interval here, A to B. So you got an X here. X would be approaching A, from the right, right? And if, if you had an x over here close to b, it would be getting close to b from the left. We have the idea of, if you're wanting to get continuity sort of at the left-hand endpoint of an interval, you'll need the function to be right continuous at that point. And so to be right continuous means you're gonna have to use the concept of a one-sided limit. So it's kind of the same as regular continuity. Like regular continuity at a would just be limit as x goes to a, two-sided of f of x equals a. Um, but if I want to get a, I want to get continuity at the left-hand endpoint of an interval, then I need it to be right continuous, which means that the right-hand limit has to exist at that point. And similarly, we can talk about being continuous from the left at a point b. And that just means that your left-hand limit has to exist at that point and be equal to f of b. So it's essentially the same idea as the ordinary concept of continuity is just a one-sided version of it. And then if we say that a function is continuous on the whole interval, i, so i could be any one of those intervals that we talked about before, you know, like from a to b where maybe the endpoints are included, maybe not, or it could be one of those intervals that starts at a and goes to infinity or something like that. But if we want to talk about a function being continuous on the interval, it just means that it's continuous at all the points in that interval. Now, most of the points in the interval are just ordinary run-of-the-mill points where you would just do ordinary continuity. But if your point, if your interval i has contains an endpoint, then you got to think about what it means for the function to be continuous at the endpoint, either from the left or the right, as appropriate. So when you say something's continuous from the left or continuous from the right, you're not saying that it, the function is continuous. It's a, it just has a special kind of continuity. But if I say, hey, I got a function that's continuous from the right at this point, that does not mean that it's continuous at that point. It just means it's continuous from the right. And then being continuous on the whole interval means it's, it's got the ordinary notion of continuity at most of the points of the interval. And if there are any endpoints that are included, you got to do the special kind of continuity either from the left or the right. So let me give you an example of this. Here's the function f of x equals square root of 1 minus x squared. Now you may recognize that when you graph that, it's actually the top half of a circle of radius 1. And if you think about what numbers you're allowed to plug into that function, you can only plug numbers in between negative 1 and positive 1. If you try to plug anything in outside of that range, th then you start getting negatives inside the radical. So negative 1 to positive 1, endpoints included, is the domain of the function. I want to show you that this function is continuous on that interval, negative 1 to positive 1. How do we go about doing that? Well, I'm going to consider three different kinds of points. I'm going to consider the points that are not on an endpoint. So I'm going to look at these points A that are in the open interval from negative 1 to positive 1. And then I'm separately going to consider the left-hand endpoint of that interval and the right-hand endpoint of that interval. Because at those points, those endpoints, I'm going to have to consider right continuity and left continuity, right? But at the other points, I'm just going to be doing regular continuity. So if I want to show regular continuity at these ordinary points on the open interval from negative 1 to positive 1, what I need to show is that the limit as x approaches a of the function, 
f of x is equal to f of a. Just I want I want to show that the function f has the direct substitution property whenever you're at a point in the interior of the interval. It's important that you think about the function f as being a composition. It's really some function raised to the one half power. One half power means square root, right? And then the function that's on the inside is the one minus square root of x. It's helpful to think about it that way because we got some theorems about how to take limits of compositions of functions. So if I do the limit as x approaches a of f of x, I'm looking at the limit as x approaches a of one minus x squared all to the one half. When I look at the inside function, it's a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous everywhere. And what's more, if I would plug any of those a's over here on the graph, let me pick like an arbitrary a. When you plug an a in there, the output is positive, right? One minus x squared is greater than zero. So this right here is positive. So that means that I can use the root law. The root law says that as long as the as long as the limit that you take on the inside is positive, you can pull limits inside of roots. So here I'm going to use the root law and say, well, this is one minus uh, the limit as x goes to a of one minus x squared to the one half. The limit on the inside, I'm just doing a polynomial, so I can do direct substitution, and I just end up with one minus a squared to the one half. So to get to this step right here, I use the root law for doing limits. And then, um, yeah, at this point, I see this is just f of a. The result of the limit was just direct substitution, right? So that gives me continuity at any of the points a in the middle. And then doing the endpoints is pretty similar. Like at the, at the left-hand endpoint, I want to show that the limit as x goes to negative 1 on the right of that function f of x, I need that to equal f of negative 1. So that's the concept of being left continuous. The calculation goes the same way because we had a one-sided version of the root law, and it works out the same way as before. You do limit as x, like the limit of f of x, as x approaches negative 1 on the right, f of x is the limit as x approaches negative 1 on the right of square root of 1 minus x squared. So that one-sided version of the root law says I can pull the limit inside the root so long as you don't end up with something negative on the inside, which we're not going to. We're not going to get anything negative. We're just going to get 0, right? So I get square root of 0. But you can take the square root of zero. Square root of zero is just zero, so that's fine. And that's equal to f of negative one. If you take the original function and you just put negative one in there, you get zero. So the limit of f of x on the right at negative one equals f of negative one. That's what we needed to have left continuity. So we do have left continuity at the left at the I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been calling that left continuity. I should have been calling that right continuity. Oops. But it's easy to get mixed up because it's the left-hand endpoint. So you want to have right continuity at the left-hand endpoint. Right. So at negative 1, I needed right continuity. And then similarly at the other endpoint, i got to go x is going to 1 on the left, f of x. I want that to be equal to f of 1. Oh, by the way, I just re I realized I was using an abbreviation that I didn't tell you what it meant earlier. But this abbreviation, W2S, was just my shorthand for saying I want to show, in case you didn't pick up on that. So I was saying each time what I wanted to show because that's what you need to show to get continuity. So on this last one, what I want to show is that the, the function is left continuous at the right-hand endpoint. And it goes exactly the same way as the previous one did. You go limit as x goes to negative 1. I'm sorry, positive 1 on the left. And I'm going to use the one-sided version of the root law to get the answer I want. The one-sided version of the root law says, yes, you can pull the limit inside there. And then once you're inside there, you're taking the limit of a polynomial, which can be done by direct substitution. And you direct substitute, and you get square root of 0, which is 0, which is the same as f of 1. When you plug 1 into the original function, that's what you get is 0, right? So there you go. So this shows you that that function the semicircle, is continuous on the entire interval from negative 1 to positive 1, 
And the point of it was that since it was an interval that had endpoints included in it, we had to specially like inspect what's going on at those endpoints that are included. But otherwise, it was just ordinary continuity. If you don't remember, so I was, there's a lot going on here, but if you didn't remember what I meant by the one-sided version of the root law, you should press pause and go pull up the notes for the class or use your book and just look up what that one-sided version of the root law says and make sure that I'm using it correctly as I go there. So this example that we just did sort of leads us into this next theorem about how to deal with functions involving roots. So now we're getting back into the mode of building up our repertoire of different kinds of functions that are continuous. And so we want to know how to, you know, determine continuity when we're dealing with functions that involve radicals. So this thing really kind of has two parts. It has the part where n is an odd integer, and then it has the part where n is an even integer. But it's just saying when n is an odd integer, you know when you're doing roots with, when you're doing odd indexed roots, you don't have to worry about taking square roots of negative numbers, or, you know, you can take the cube root of a negative number or the fifth root of a negative number. So in this part, you don't have to worry about that. And so it just says that when you take some function that you know is continuous, f of x, and you raise it to an nth power where n is odd, the result's going to be continuous. So odd powers are kind of nice that way. So take any function that you know is continuous, take the cube root of it, for example, you automatically know it's continuous. That's what this theorem says. You gotta be a little bit more careful when you're doing even roots, like square roots. So if you started with a continuous function f of x and you raised it to, and you did a square root, then that function would be continuous everywhere where the function is positive. So you've got this, um, a little extra condition that you have to think about whenever you're dealing like square roots or fourth roots, even roots. And notice that the theorem here does not include the possibility that f of a equals zero. You can take the square root of zero or the fourth root of zero, but whenever f of a is equal to zero, that sort of represents an endpoint of the uh, domain of the root function. And so there you get into this sort of one, you know, left continuity or right continuity right continuity business. So you can't say that it's just regular old continuous. You might be able to say something about left or right continuity, but um, that's why they don't include the possibility of equal to zero there. Anyway, all this theorem is, it's just a kind of a restatement of the root law, which says that when you're taking the limit of a root function that you can pull the limit inside the root, so long as you don't get negatives inside the radical, right? So the cave caveat here that I wanted to mention was um, this theorem says nothing about about the case where f of a is equal to zero. In those cases you have to you have to hope that maybe you can show left continuity or right continuity. Maybe you can even get two-sided continuity in special cases, but um, this theorem doesn't guarantee anything. So let's look at this example right here though. So here we're doing a cube root. I want to know where is it continuous? Like what, for what values of x is it continuous? And I see that my function is a like the outside function of it is a cube root. So this is really, to make it look more like the previous theorem, we're talking about x squared minus 4x minus 10, all raised to the one third power. So what does the theorem say about continuity when you've got a root function like this? It says, okay, if you got an odd integer, it says you need the inside function f of x to be continuous in order to know that the root you know, putting the root on it, it's going to be continuous. So what is our, what are we can, what is our inside function? Well, our inside function here, the f function, well, you can see that the inside function is a polynomial. And what do you know about polynomials? They're continuous everywhere. Let's write that up here, over here to the side somewhere. So since g of x equals f of x to the one third, where f is a polynomial, which is continuous for all x, and the root is odd, then what was the number on that theorem? Theorem 2.13 says g of x is continuous at all real numbers x. This function g just doesn't have a bad place. It's good everywhere. We could take it a little bit further. Now that I know this is a continuous function, suppose I wanted to take a limit. Let's say I wanted to take the limit as x goes to whatever, 1. 
of the cube root of x squared minus 4x minus 10. This function is continuous. What do you know about taking the limits of continuous functions? That's right. You don't have to think about it at all. You just do direct substitution. A cube root. Cube root of negative 13, whatever that is. That's the answer. So knowing that our function was continuous was great. Makes calculating limits a snap. Just plug in the number. We're getting not too far from the end. We're building up our repertoire of continuous things. You may recall in our last lesson, we used the squeeze law and we showed that when you take the limit of the sine function as x goes to zero, you get zero. And when you take the limit of the cosine function as x goes to zero, you get one. I want to know though, what happens whenever not x is going to zero, but x is going to just any old value of you know, like just a, an arbitrary a. Like what happens when x goes to pi over 2? Or what happens when x goes to 3? Or whatever. Well, it turns out that just knowing those two green limits, and then also it's an exercise in the textbook that you can do a little witchcraft with these so-called sum of angle identities. And from those identities and what we have in green up there, you can deduce that the limit whenever x is approaching a, some arbitrary value of the sine function, you get just sine of a. And likewise, the limit as x approaches a of the cosine is cosine of a. Now, if you've been paying attention, you realize that this tells you something. I took the limit as x approaches a of sine of x, and I got sine of a. What does that tell me about the sine function? You guessed it. That means the sine function is continuous. Same thing happened for cosine. Look, what we just what those two limits point out is that sine and cosine have the direct substitution property for limits, which is another way to say continuity. See, how did you get the limit for doing, you know, when you're doing limit as x goes to a of sine of x? How did you get the answer? You just simply plugged in a. Same thing for cosine. So they have the direct substitution property. That means continuity. So we know sine and cosine are continuous. And because it worked for any value of a, we're talking about for all real numbers x here. Okay, so I do encourage you, maybe as a challenge, you should go look at that exercise 105 in our textbook. Um, it's not super hard to work this out that um, the sine and the cosine limits in yellow there are true. And then from there, I can start asking, well, how about tangent? How about cotangent? How about secant? How about cosecant? Those are the other six basic trigonometric or the other four of the six trigonometric basic functions. Um, well, how about tangent? I'm not going to do all four of them, but maybe we could do tangent. Well, you know tangent of x is equal to sine of x over cosine of x, right? We had limit rules earlier in this in today's lesson that said that when you're dividing one continuous function by another continuous function, the result is continuous except possibly where the denominator is equal to zero. So this tells me the tangent function is continuous for all x except those values of x where the cosine function, the denominator, is equal to zero. And off the top of my head, I think I can probably figure out, see cosine is equal to zero at pi over two and then three pi over two. So it's numbers like this, um, pi over two plus like any multiple of pi, like n times pi, where n is an integer. At pi over 2, then add pi, you'd get 3 pi over 2. Subtract pi, you'd get negative pi over 2. Yeah, so you'd, this would give you all the places where cosine is equal to 0. And you can check it out. I mean, we can make a graph of tangent real quick. Wouldn't be hard. So you can see that the tangent function has lots of uh, asymptotes, places where it blows up. Those are the, exactly the places where cosine is equal to 0. So, unfortunately, this grapher doesn't really put the multiples of pi over 2 on the graph for you, but, like, I know pi over 2 is about, like, 1.7 or something like that. It's like 3.1, 3.14 divided by 2. And you can see that, yeah, about 1.6, that's where this function's kind of starting to blow up. It's a little hard to see. You'd have to, really, like, really scale up here. But eventually, it starts getting over there close to 1.7. 
between 1.5 and 1.6. Um, so anyway, yeah. And then, but those are the only places where the tangent function is having a sort of jump. The rest of the places, everything's good. And that's just what, you know, we saw from our theory here. And you can do the same sort of analysis for cotangent. And it's, in, you know, cotangent is the cosine divided by the sine. So you got to look at the places where the sine is going to be equal to zero. So that'd just be multiples of pi. Um, and similar secant and cosecant, you just have to figure out where the denominators are equal to zero. We're not going to go through individually every function that you might ever run into to discuss the continuity in detail. But this little theorem 1.15 here gives a summary. So basically what this thing says is that all these weird transcendental functions, tra so transcendental functions are functions that they're not defined in terms of like addition and multiplication and, you know, the ordinary operations that you use. Um, they have stranger definitions, you know, like sine and cosine have to do with points on a circle and stuff like that. Um, so, but anyway, all these trans so-called transcendental functions in this list are continuous everywhere where they're defined. So like when we're just doing the tangent function, the tangent function is not defined for every value of x. There are some x's where you get zeros in the denominator, right? But what it's saying is, is that those are the only problems. Everywhere else, the function's nice and continuous. So, oh, inverse trigonometric functions. You may not remember those, but we'll be bringing them up from time to time. They're just the functions that do the opposite of what, you know, the regular trig functions do. And you got your exponential functions like 2 to the x or 3 to the x, generally speaking, b to the x. You know, they all have this sort of graph shape that looks like this. Um, you got logarithms that all have this sort of general shape like this. Exponentials and logarithms are inverses of one another. Um, all of these functions, they're continuous everywhere they are defined. So this is really good news. So this tells us, you know, because I showed you all those theorems of future calculus stuff that depends on your functions being continuous. As long as we stay away from the trouble spots, all those functions, every function in the world that you can think of that you've ever encountered in your life so far, um, are pretty good have lots of good properties so we can we're going to be able to do calculus with all these good types of functions so here are a couple of examples just to sort of drive home the point about knowing about the continuity of all these different kinds of functions so we've got some weird functions involved I guess the first one's not so bad let's start with it really the only weird function it involves is a cosine function we know cosines are continuous everywhere so I can plug any value I want into the cosine function, and it equals the limit. So in this fraction, I'm, maybe I can just plug in pi and be done, because everything in sight is continuous. Like, it's easy to see that since co we know cosine is continuous, then when you square it, we know that's continuous. And when you add it to some other things that are continuous, that's continuous. So the numerator is continuous. The denominator is continuous. So this thing is a ratio of continuous functions, and I know that whenever that's the case, we have the rule for continuity that says when you have a fraction of continuous things, um, it'll be continuous so long as you don't get zero in the denominator. So that's the only thing i got to worry about. So what is cosine of pi? Uh-oh, cosine of pi is negative 1. That's a problem. Well, that's okay. We know that um, from experience, we know that just getting a zero in the denominator is not necessarily a deal breaker. We, we might just have to do some algebra to sort of get rid of it. And then maybe after we get rid of the problem in the denominator, we can take the limit. So let's see if we can do something like that. Well, it may not be immediately apparent, but what I'm realizing here is that that numerator is really a quadratic in disguise. And I know that quadratic things can be factored oftentimes. In fact, you know, if if I just think about the related expression, x squared minus x minus 2, like I know that can be factored as like, what? x minus 2 times x plus 1. Does that check out? Yeah, you'd get x squared, a plus x, and a minus 2x would give you a minus x in the middle, and then a minus 2. Right. So really, 
that expression up there with the cosines, I can apply the same algebra to it, and it would factor as cosine x minus 2 times cosine x plus 1 over cosine x plus 1. Hey, that's fabulous. Look. The denominator was cosine x plus 1, and I have that whole factor in the top, so I can cancel them like that. And that leaves me with just taking the limit as x goes to pi of cosine of x minus 2. Now this expression that I need to take the limit of is the difference between the continuous function cosine and the continuous function 2. And so the difference of continuous functions is continuous. I can evaluate the limit by direct substitution. And so I get cosine of pi minus 2, or in other words, negative 1 minus 2, which is negative 3. So I was able to take advantage of continuity as soon as I was able to you know, plug in and not get 0 in the denominator. And in a similar way, the part B problem actually is easier, even though probably you're more scared of natural logs and uh, inverse trig functions. But if you get over that fear, maybe do some review with those types of functions, there's nothing to fear. So if I want to take the limit of the natural log of x over the arc sine, we saw in our previous little summary of transcendental functions that both of these functions are continuous on their domains. So we're wanting to know what happens at x equals 1. And I know that the domain of the natural log function is 0 to infinity, 0 not included, so all positive x values. And the arc sine, um, its domain, you can plug in numbers between negative 1 and positive 1, endpoints included. I just need to know what you get when you plug in. So both. So the point is, is that both of these functions are continuous, and we're talking about at x equals 1 here. And so we can evaluate by direct substitution as long as we don't get 0 in the denominator. So as long as this is not 0 in the denominator, we're good to go. So what is the inverse sine of 1? Well, you just have to ask yourself, what at what angle, what angle between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 do you plug into sine and you get an output of 1? And of course the answer is pi over 2. So the denominator is not 0 here, so I'm not dividing by 0, so it is okay to just direct substitute. And the natural log of 1 turns out, so you have to ask yourself, to what power do I raise e to get 1? Well, e to the 0 is equal to 1, so the numerator is 0, so this just comes out to 0. And I got it just by direct substitution, and the reason I could do direct substitution was because I knew about the continuity of the functions involved. Our last topic for the day is a very important theorem called the Intermediate Value Theorem. At first glance, the Intermediate Value Theorem is a little scary looking and doesn't seem to have any particular um, value in terms of like helping you compute things. Like, is it going to make you do calculus faster or something like that? doesn't seem like it, but actually the intermediate value theorem is very important and has a lot of practical application. Um, but let me tell you what it says, and then I'll tell you a nice application of it. So you got to start by supposing that you got a continuous function on the closed interval a to b, and we know what that means now. And you've got some number between the output values of f of a and f of b. So then it tells you that there has to be one value in the middle between a and b that gives you that L value when you plug it into the function. That's really hard to make some sense out of, so let me draw a picture of it here. So on the left, I'm going to draw what, what it looks like when you have a continuous function from A to B. So a continuous function from A to B sort of generically would look like, I don't know, something like this. It just doesn't have any jumps or breaks in it, right? You can kind of wobble around a little bit, but um, no jumps or breaks or holes. So now, from the graph here, F of A you would see f of a on the y-axis right here. And f of b, similarly, you would see it on the y-axis a little higher there. So here's f of b. So the intermediate value theorem says, OK, take some number l in between those two numbers on the y-axis. So let's say l is here. The, the intermediate value theorem says there has to be some number between a and b 
that you can plug into the function. In fact, you can kind of see what it would have to be graphically. Your C would have to be about right here, right? There has to be some number C that when you plug it into the function, you get back L. I mean, what if there were no C? That would mean that the function would be have to would have to somehow be jumping over this horizontal line at height y, you know, the horizontal line y equals l, right? But we've assumed the function is continuous, so it can't really like just sort of jump over this horizontal line. It's got to cross through it. Now, if you had a function that was doing something like this on the right, where maybe it does like goes up like this, and then uh oh, there's a discontinuity, and it does something like this, and then it goes on and whatever, stops at B over here somewhere. Then here would be your F of A, and over here would be your F of B. F of B. And what if I put my L right there? In that case, there is no value that you plug into the function, and it gives you the Y value of L, right? So, so whenever the function's not continuous on the interval, then that tells you, oh, well, maybe you could jump over this horizontal line. So you might be thinking to yourself, who cares? Well, let me give you an <laughs> let me give you a really nice application. I think it's nice anyway. So before I show you the application, I, I want you to just think about equation solving. I bet you uh, lots of times you've gotten out a calculator or a computer to solve some sort of equation for you. Have you ever given any thought to like how the computer solves equations? Probably not. You've probably been content just to plug in your equation and get your answer, right? But somebody, at some point in time, has to program that calculator or that computer program. And if you were programming a computer to solve equations, one thing you might program the computer to do before it tried to solve the equation would be to just check, is there even a solution at all? Because you might, if there was no solution, your program might go into some sort of infinite loop and you know cause the computer to crash or something like that. So you'd like to know ahead of time before you start trying to run some algorithm to solve an equation, does there even exist a solution? And that's what the intermediate value theorem can help you do. And I have to tell you, not every equation that, most equations that you write down are impossible to solve by hand. Um, the equation that I wrote down here, negative x to the fifth minus x to the, or minus 4x squared plus 2 squared of x plus 5 equals 0. Now I haven't tried to solve this by hand personally, but I suspect that it would be very difficult. I would be very surprised if one of you would just quickly whip out a solution to this by hand where you found all the solutions. But what I can do is I can do, I can use the intermediate value theorem to verify that this thing actually does have some solution in the interval of zero to three. So imagine I had some algorithm that could find the solution for me if it existed, now it, I would run this little pre-check. Okay, it does have a solution. Then I'd run my little algorithm to try to find that solution, um, or at least some decimal approximation of the solution. And a little later in the class, we're going to um, learn about something called Newton's method, which is a method that does exactly this sort of thing. It uses calculus to help you solve equations. So before you run your Newton's method formula thing on it, Let's know that it, there actually is a solution. So here's how we can determine that using the um, intermediate value theorem. So observe that the function f of x equals negative x to the fifth minus 4x squared plus 2 squared of x plus 5 is continuous on the interval 0 to infinity. How do I know that? Well, I just look at all the little pieces that make up the function. I got an x to the fifth, check. That's like a polynomial, right? In fact, I could just round up all the pieces that would form a single polynomial. The negative x to the fifth and the negative 4x squared and the plus 5. That's a polynomial. I know that's continuous everywhere. And then the square root function I know is continuous on its domain, which is 0 to infinity. I can't plug any negative numbers into this function, unfortunately. But that's okay. Now... I know this function is continuous on 0 to infinity. Next, what is f of 0? Well, f of 0 is, I can just, you know, at that function, I can tell at a glance that I just get 5, right? And also, I need to figure out what f of 3 is, because in the intermediate value theorem up here, you need to know about f of a and f of b, right? So my a and my b 
or the endpoints of that interval zero to three. I don't know what f of three is. I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna use a calculator to do that. Let me. Oh, turns out Desmos has a nice little function you can do here. So you can actually make a function. You can go f of x equals, and then what was it? Negative x to the fifth. I can see that it does indeed have a solution between zero and three from the graph, but you know, you're going to have a hard time writing. If you're trying to do this thinking of writing a computer program, the computer program's not going to generate a graph and then look at the graph and decide the computer program is going to need some sort of like numerical check, right? So that's kind of what this intermediate value theorem provides. So anyway, now that I've got this function punched in though, what I really want to do is I want to know what f of three is. So f of three. Negative 270.5 about. Okay, fine. So f of 3 is about negative 270. Okay. Now, now I know what my f of a and my f of b are. Notice that 0, the number 0, is between f of 0 and f of 3. Because f of 0 is positive and f of 3 is negative. So zero is in between, right? So therefore, by the so-called intermediate value theorem, I'm just going to call it IVT, by the intermediate value theorem, there exists some number C in the closed interval, or in the, yeah, in the open interval, yeah, open interval zero to three, such that, um, f of c must be equal to zero. That is negative c to the fifth minus four c squared plus two square root of c plus five is equal to zero. So that means c is a solution to the equation, right? So we just showed that there's some solution. C, I don't, now this theorem doesn't tell you what c is. It just tells you that such a C exists. And so now if I had some other algorithm that I wanted to run to actually home in on what the solution is in some repetitive way, we could run that solution, run that algorithm and it would probably work. So I think that's practical. A practical application of this theorem that seems like it's a, you know, doesn't have any immediate computational use, but actually it does have computational use. It's something that you can use as a check before you waste a lot of computation time on something that doesn't exist. All right, I think that's all I have for you today. It is, and so I will tell you goodbye now. Goodbye.